people joining us. We're up to 460, 470. We are recording. Thank you. We will, if you have submitted your ISA certification code during registration, and send it to ISA for you to be processed. So if you put it in, there's nothing else you need to do at this time. Welcome, Eugene, Oregon. Okay, everybody. Uh, my clock is reading 12 Central. Welcome to the Tree Fund webinar series. My name is Bo Broadbeck, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of the host, Auburn University. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us on this fantastic webinar series that we've been running for a few years now and sharing this experience that we have. We have always a number of great speakers on here. We do several of these a year. And so thank you very much. Uh, today, I have, we have invited Randy Miller to give us a little bit of a background on the Tree Fund and provide an introduction to who Tree Fund is and also introduce today's speaker. So with us, we have Randy Miller. He is with CNUC Utilities. He's the Director, Director of Research and Development he is a past trustee and chair of the board of trustees at Tree Fund and now on the ISA board of directors. And so Randy, welcome. And I will turn the virtual floor over to you this morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bo. As, as Bo said, I have been involved with the Tree Fund for over a decade. I'm a tour de tree rider and am dedicated to the organization. So even though I, I don't serve on the board, it's important to me and I'm happy to help the Tree Fund out whenever I can. And so I volunteered today to help. Uh, this webinar is presented by the Tree Fund and we're a nonprofit organization committed to exploring and sharing the science of trees and how they contribute to our lives, our communities, our economy, and our planet. For a full schedule of our 2022 webinars, you may go to the Tree Fund website, treefund.org. With these webinars, Tree Fund gives you an opportunity to learn emerging knowledge gathered from Tree Fund supported projects and an opportunity to earn CEUs. Please donate at treefund.org or follow the link that Monica is now posting in the chat box to support and make a difference. I'll take a little unscripted note here. Many people here are trying to get or uh, are enrolled in this presentation viewing in order to get CEUs to support their ISA certification. Uh, people that are ISA certified, of which there are about 40,000 in the world now, I understand, are dedicated to trees. And many of us make our living in tree care. If everyone that's a certified arborist made donating to the tree fund, part of their annual charitable giving at $100 a year, we would have $4 million a year to dedicate to projects uh, such as Dr. Hirons here and many, many others. As it is, we raise about 380 on an average year with the Tour de Trees. And, and I'm pretty disappointed in that given the potential volume that we had because $4 million would enable us to make a big difference in the world and, and we'd be able to do something transformative. So if you're listening here and you're a certified arborist or if someone or if you care about trees, consider making the tree fund part of your annual charitable giving at $100. So uh, on that note, uh, last housekeeping before I introduce our speaker is in accordance with the International Society of Arboriculture and Society of American Forester guidelines, the Tree Fund will submit your name and certification number and ISA uh, uh, number for credit. If you have not submitted your certification number during registration, please email treefundwebinars at gmail.com, as Monica has told us already, with your name and certification number. You must watch the entire webinar in order to qualify for credits. And now on to our guest today. Our presenter today is a senior lecturer in arboriculture at University Center Myers Co. in the UK. 
His teaching responsibilities focus on modules relating to tree biology, tree establishment, and tree management to both full-time and online students up to the master's level. Having started his career as a climbing arborist and plant healthcare technician, he is particularly interested in the application of science to practice, making sure that arboricultural management is evidence-based wherever possible. To this end, he co-authored Applied Tree Biology to support others in understanding tree biology and how it relates to managing trees in urban environments. For him, all good tree management practices are founded on an understanding of tree biology. In addition to teaching, he is engaged with research and active collaborations in the United States, Canada, Australia, Sweden, the Netherlands, and in the UK. This is motivated by a need to create resilience in our urban forests and is focused on using plant traits to inform species selection for urban environments. A particular focus of his has been assessing the drought tolerance of a wide range of species, about 200, by measuring the turgor loss point. However, he has also worked on the evaluation of waterlogging tolerance using sap flow. This work has resulted in a number of peer-reviewed publication, as well as professional guidance entitled Tree Species Selection for Green Infrastructure, a guide for specifiers published by Trees and Design Action Group. The digital guidance is freely available and translates the scientific principles of tree selection to a range of audiences in an accessible way. It has now been downloaded over 20,000 times and currently translated into Dutch and French. Recently, he has been trailing the use of IoT, which is Internet of Things sensors, to monitor the performance of trees in a range of treescapes. These approaches promise to give us some fascinating insights into the dynamic life of trees to provide new ways to evaluate tree environment relationships. To present to us today on enhancing the performance of urban stormwater schemes in tree selection, I welcome Dr. Andrew Hirons. Well, uh, thank you so much, Randy, for that introduction. Um, that was really fantastic. Can you see my screen? Is that? I can, yes, yep. Okay, brilliant. Um, well, I don't need to introduce myself after, after that, do I? That was, um, that was amazing. Uh, it's my great pleasure to, to be here with you all. And it was, uh, yeah, fantastic to see uh, so many countries and different regions popping up as a participant said hello. Um, so I was really, really encouraged by that. It is, it's great to have the opportunity to speak to so many of you. Um, and it's great to have this opportunity to share some of the, the tree fund research that was, um, I started in 2018. So it's sort of come through to fruition now. And it was all really geared around trying to understand how we can select trees for stormwater management schemes more effectively. So that's going to be the focus of today's webinar. Just a little bit of context though first, of course, you know, many of you will be working quite actively in the urban forest uh, and managing the urban forest. And we hope of course that most of the urban forest is, if you like, performing well, but we expect that some of it will inevitably be um, performing rather poorly. That could be because of constrained rooting environments or pressures above ground, a combination of, of things. But ultimately, as we look forward and as we try to have foresight uh, into the future, we know that things like climate change and particularly in some regions, the accelerated migration of pests and pathogens really shift a lot of that urban forest, if you like, through that poor performance threshold and even beyond into the tree mortality threshold. And so for that reason, um, the species selection uh, is, is really critically important and an understanding not just um, which species, but which palette of species uh, are gonna be best to meet our, our future needs. And so that's, um, been quite a preoccupation 
of mine over the last uh, several years. One thing that we don't often uh, talk about uh, is the, the change in precipitation and extreme precipitation events um, with climate change. And this is a recent nature paper that came out and it shows that uh, in humid regions, the, this study at least projects that an increase by 6.31% in one in 30 year extreme precipitations per degree Celsius. So we, you know, in other words, we, you know, the one in 30 year event will become a one in 28 year event. And that may sound um, not too uh, difficult to encounter, but some of these extreme uh, events can be really, really challenging. And, um, and I hope that, you know, this, this research that I share today will help us, you know, in some small way, prepare and understand how species, our tree species will respond to water logging. And, and, and that, because that may well be uh, much more frequent um, in the future, particularly in the more humid regions. So there is, there is some interesting work around that. There's, as well as the issues around uh, climate change, um, well, in the UK, we call, we call these sort of schemes SUDs, sustainable drainage schemes. Um, but I, I believe that uh, it might be sort of more generally referred to as stormwater management schemes. But we've got a, you know, a number of other drivers um, for SUDs compatible trees, if you like. Um, of course, high density developments um, mean that you get an awful lot of water coming off roofs and paved surfaces. And uh, the, the engineered solutions for removing that water can be really quite uh, substantial and also you know, very expensive. So integrating um, stormwater management into the, the pits of trees is, is something that's beginning to get really quite a lot of attention now. So inevitably with high density developments, there needs to be some way to manage the water that's coming off the paved uh, surfaces and, and, and the roofs and so on. And at least in the UK, we're beginning now to have to integrate sustainable drainage uh, as, as a course of um, law, you know, it's becoming regulated. And, and just quite recently in Wales, there's some statutory guidance that's come out. And, you know, we, we understand that in Scotland and England, certainly this sort of regulation around the requirement to um, have stormwater management within any new development is, is, you know, in the pipeline. So we've got some, climate change imperatives, we've got regulation imperatives, and just that fundamental need to deal with stormwater off the, off the, uh, off the developments. So again, a little bit of context, this, this um, guidance was uh, mentioned in, in the introduction there. This is uh, the project that I delivered with uh, Dr. Henrik Harman uh, of, of uh, in Sweden. And this is, it was focused on the UK, but uh, you know, we're both passionate about delivering robust evidence-based species selection. And um, you can download this, this guide from, from the TDAG website, the Trees and Design Action Group a website, that's tdag.org.uk. And you'll find this guide as well as lots of other guides that are, are really um, useful on that site. And what it does, is it uh, has a whole range of introductory chapters and then about 280 odd profiles um, of different species. And it, it looks at, among other things, things like the natural habitat of the trees, the environmental tolerance, ornamental qualities, and so on. Um, and one of the categories that we, we try to um, make recommendations on is the use potential. And now obviously things like the parkland environment, so that that's, uh, includes pretty much every, every species. Uh, the paved environment, for example, well, that uh, has, a, if you like, a filter that requires at least a moderate tolerance to drought, because we know that in paved environments, um, you know, where you've decoupled the precipitation, if you like, from the soil moisture, uh, then drought tolerance is a really key factor in those trees performing well. And we also had a category 
uh, called SUT, Sustainable Drainage System Trees. Now, um, these trees are actually really, really challenging to identify because not only do they require um, waterlogging tolerance, we think about uh, suds trees being, you know, required to cope with uh, regular flooding and waterlogging, but they also uh, have to be able to cope with um, quite substantial periods of, of drought. And so uh, the, the suds trees had to have a moderate tolerance to drought because the soils and the substrates that are used within the sort of typical sud specifications um, can have an infiltration rate of anything between two to 400 millimeters per hour. So really they drain very, very quickly um, and they flood very regularly. So they, they've got to be able, the trees that are, are well suited to these conditions have to have a, a moderate tolerance to drought as well as what we termed a moderate tolerance to, to waterlogging as well. And that actually really narrows the, the scopes down for species that are suitable for those conditions. You're really talking about riparian species that grow along seasonal watercourses and, and, and that sort of environment. Um, and actually out of those 280 species, we only had 16 species, about 6%, that were, we, we deemed to be suitable for those really highly dynamic suds schemes. And so, you know, that got us thinking, you know, well, we need to try and do a better job for landscape architects and other people that are specifying trees in terms of understanding which trees might be suitable for those, um, those sorts of scenarios. And so it was that really that prompted this research, it was that that, um, yeah, was if you like the inspiration behind, you know, the research and, and the challenge of the research. How do we go about understanding the waterlogging tolerance of trees in a bit more detail? And this is the sort of um, scenario by which uh, trees can be placed into a, a sub scheme. This is a a scheme designed by Green Blue Urban is a, a company in the UK, but they also were represented in, in Canada, I know, and, and, and around the world and North America more generally. And this is uh, one of their sustainable urban drainage um, tree pits uh, in, in, in construction. And you get, uh, oh, um, you can get schemes such as this, which look like a, a sort of urban plaza scheme, uh, but actually, a really well integrated um, suds uh, pits that are all, all interconnected and they hold a lot of water and, and can really um, hold back uh, some of that flood water from getting into the main engineered uh, solutions within the urban environment and make a really meaningful difference to the, to the, uh, yeah, the flood management and the, wa the water management of that, that particular catchment. So this sort of thing is becoming more and more popular and more and more necessary. Um, and it will continue to do so over the coming decades. So as I said, you know, what is the, you know, how, how do we go about selecting uh, for water lock intolerance? What are the, what are the options? Um, and oh, I suppose, before we, we look at water logging and, and its effect on trees more generally, it is perhaps worth just saying, well, what, what's the difference between water logging and flooding? So water logging is simply the, um, the, where, the, where the water table, if you like, or the water uh, fills all the micro and macro pores up and the, the, water, the, the soil is totally saturated. So that is, if you like, the definition of, of water logging. Flooding can, can be a much more general type of a, an event, if you like. So where uh, the bank of a river is breached and you also get potentially quite fast floodwaters, you might get debris coming down downstream. You often have much more turbulent, um, yeah, turbulent water. Uh, and and that that brings with it different challenges, um, and flooding can often also result in you know high levels of 
uh, silt dis uh, deposition and so on. So waterlogging and flooding are, are somewhat interchangeable, but they are distinctive as well. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about the waterlogging uh, and flood tolerance in, in trees. And it's, it's a really complex abiotic stress. That's one of the things that makes it quite interesting, but also makes it quite challenging to uh, unravel, if you like. And, uh, you know, every abiotic stress has is, is, is got uh, complexity to it. But the timing of the flood or the waterlogging event can have a profound difference on the tree's response. So most, most of our temperate trees, particularly, can cope really quite well with, you know, quite extended periods of waterlogging during winter. But you have that same period in summer when the roots are active, the, the crown's active, it's growing and so on, and it has a totally different effect. Uh, the, the relative depth can be really important. Um, the duration of the flooding, clearly that, that's um, of critical interest and the frequency of flooding uh, is important because actually you get these sort of stress recovery cycles. And, you know, particularly for, for sud uh, scheme trees, you, you need a degree of recovery uh, uh, between those, those stress cycles. And, you know, the schematic there from Glenn's uh, paper um, just, I won't talk through it all, but it just gives you an idea of some of the complexity um, within, within uh, flooding tolerance. Uh, it's going to affect, you know, physiology, it's going to affect metabolism, hormone balance, uh, nutrient uptake, water absorption. Interestingly, um, one of the, the major challenges, of course, is, is not so much the amount of water, but the lack of oxygen. And it's the oxygen deficit which really drives most of the problems uh, from the tree's point of view. Uh, you know, gases are transported 10,000 times more slowly through water than they are through the atmosphere. So if you like, it's 10,000 times more challenging for the tree to access oxygen. Um, and that is really problematic for those fine roots. Um, and so, yeah, uh, that is, is uh, then forces the hand of the tree, so to say, into an anaerobic respiration. And that, that fermentation process can actually release toxic uh, products uh, in its own right, and particularly upon reoxygenation. So when you get that drained, you get that. Um, oxygen coming back to the roots, that can re release a pulse of um, toxins from the roots, and we call that post-anoxic stress. So we have, you know, lots of things going on, all of which can contribute to, to the decline of trees uh, as, as a result of flooding and water logging. So one of the things I chose to study um, the stress is sap flow. You might ask, well, why, why sap flow? Sap flow is fantastic because it gives you pretty much continuous data. That this data is at 10 minute resolution. So near, near continuous data. It's sensitive to the atmospheric and andidaphic conditions, the soil conditions. So you can see here that period where it's cool, uh, it had high relative humidity and rain, that vapor pressure deficit, which is the atmosphere drought, if you like, how dry the atmosphere is, really suppressed the sap velocity, the sap flow. Whereas uh, in this period of warm uh, conditions and low relative humidity, uh, increased vapor pressure deficits, or increased drying potential of the, of the air, you get a much higher sap velocity. And actually, once you get your eye in, you can almost read what the weather was doing uh, just by looking at the sap flow in trees. And this is, uh, to me, was, you know, really, really fascinating. And so I, I thought, well, we must be able to use sap flow to, to understand abiotic stress much more widely than we, we currently do. And so uh, one of the, the principal things that I wanted to investigate in this the research project that Tree Fund kindly sponsored, was 
you know, can we use sap flow to understand waterlogging tolerance of trees much more, much more, uh, more systematically? So the the hypothesis that I wanted to explore as well: what does will waterlogging will reduce sap flow in trees? Um, it'll reduce sap flat sap flow in trees for a number of reasons, potentially, but ultimately, the effects of that waterlogging will integrate to reduce sap flow, and the velocity, the extent of the decline in sap flow is related to the tolerance of a species to waterlogging and. I looked at nine different species in, in this over two, two growing seasons. So Acer platinoides and Acer rubrum, um, two maples there, an alder, Ulnus glutinosa, that's our European alder, Carpenus betulus, you'll be familiar with Carpenus, um, but that's, that's our European hornbeam. A lot of you in the States will be very familiar with liquid amber, styrofoam flua. Um, Populus tremula is very similar to Populus tremuloides. It's kind of our European version of that. Prunus macchiae, which is a uh, Siberian cherry, uh, a willow, Salix alba, and a lime, Tilia cordata. So that, you know, across those species, that really represented um, a good range of different tolerances uh, from what we assume to be sensitive to waterlogging uh, right the way through to uh, to tolerant of waterlogging. And so I had this little field site at, um, on campus at Myers Co. and designed a fairly straightforward uh, experiment where, whereby we, we had a sort of containerized nursery set up that was uh, irrigated. And then I would place some of the trees into bigger buckets uh, to waterlog the trees. Uh, and then after a period of seven days, um, I would drain those, drain those containers again, and the root system would reoxygenate, and yeah, we'd we'd uh, see how how things responded. So that's the basic setup, and I was looking at uh, sap flow particularly, and I also looked at gas exchange. So that's things like photosynthesis and stomata conductance. Um, I was particularly interested in that. And so this is Prunus macchia. You can see pre-treatment, the two treatments uh, behave very similarly. Um, and then watch what happens when I waterlog. You can see this, this is uh, six individuals in each treatment group. So that the green ribbon represents the sort of standard error of the mean, but you can see that that's waterlog treatment begins to decline almost instantly after waterlogging. And then as, uh, as I drained it, the decline uh, flattens off, if you like. But interestingly, and this was fascinating for me, I had no visual symptoms whatsoever um, between the two different treatment groups, but these profound differences um, between the drained, sorry, the waterlogged and the, the control trees. And so this was, this was the first species I did. And I got really ex excited by this because it was just a really great indication that sap flow could provide this really meaningful um, trace of the progression of a stress um, within, within the tree. And often sap flow is related to to drought, but it's not not often that you see it related to to waterlogging. So that was that was really interesting and um, really sort of set set me up to uh, look at this in in much more detail. So you can see that that flattens off. And as I say, the really the really important message um, was that you got these profound physiological changes, but absolutely no difference in the visual indication um, of that stress. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if we look at that, how that compared with the photosynthesis, again, two days into waterlogging, we got highly significant differences in, in both photosynthesis and stomata conductance. And, you know, the, 
the waterlogged treatment was suppressed right the way through um, the week's wharf logging and then a week's um, kind of recovery period. And we didn't see any return um, anywhere close to returning uh, to, the, to the control conditions. So that, that water logging stress really had a profound effect on those trees. Here is the uh, Norway maple, Ace of Platinoides. I thought this would be slightly less uh, sensitive to water logging than, than the prunus. But again, uh, as soon as that water logging uh, treatment was in, deployed, we saw a really profound decline. And then really, this was really interesting because even after I drained the species, uh, actually that stress continued to the extent that all the leaves actually fell off and all that was left were the samaras on the, on the tree. And so this was uh, really uh, a little bit of a surprise actually. Uh, but yeah, you can see a really clear decline in sap flow as a result of that water logging stress. And so you know, again, a similar sort of pattern in terms of decline in sap velocity was mirrored by a decline in photosynthesis uh, and some other conductance to the point where the leaves fell off. And obviously I was unable to measure the leaf gas exchange at that point. Um, so that was, again, a species that demonstrated a really profound uh, influence uh, of, of water logging on its, on its physiology. Well, here is a, a water-loving willow, Salix alba. And the data looks rather noisy. It was a very sort of uh, inclement week, you know, with lots of kind of rain and showers and all the rest of it. But you can, so, so, which is why the data looks really spiky. But what, what you should be looking at and, and sort of identifying is actually that there is no separation at all between the, the control and the waterlogged species, either through the waterlogging period or the, the drained period. It was actually so dark that solar panels powering the, uh, powering the sat flow sensors dropped that, didn't, couldn't charge it. That's why you've got a, that sort of 24 hour kind of gap in the data. But you can see that <coughs> right the way through, uh, you know, the period of, of assessment, that willow was uh, doing just fine. Thank you very much. And here we have uh, the scheme related to with the, with the gas exchange. There was uh, at peak water stress, peak water logging stress, I should say, uh, you, it, there was a significant suppression in photosynthesis, but that had recovered very, very quickly after that was after it was drained. Um, so yeah, the, the species tolerant to water logging, you know, held, held true. We were unable to really detect anything different in the, um, in the two treatment groups there from a sap velocity point of view, although the gas exchange did, did pick up something. One of the things that surprised me was just how quickly these hypertrophied lenticels uh, appeared on the, on the willows. And these uh, lentil cells are hypertrophy. It's just a fancy word for enlarged. I don't really know why we don't just call them enlarged lentil cells. It'd be much more accessible for most people. But anyway, they're called hypertrophied lentil cells, so we'll have to go with that. Um, but these enlarged lentil cells around the base of the, the stem there just increase the access to oxygen, pulls oxygen down into the root system. And you, sorry, I was just taking a glass of water there. Um, you can see the control tree um, doesn't have any of that, uh, these, these hypertrophied lentil cells on, on the uh, base of the stem there. So that was uh, really good evidence of a, of a particular trait that's associated with flooding tolerance, flooding adaptation in trees. 
Okay, I'm sorry, I was struggling to uh, progress the presentation. Now. So uh, just a couple of other species, I won't go through all the species um, because we haven't got uh, a massive amount of time. But uh, this was a, a species that I looked at in the subsequent year and I thought it just showed quite a nice sort of stress and recovery cycle. So you can see this is the hornbeam. During the waterlogging period, the, the treatment, the waterlogging treatment does somewhat depart a little bit from the, from the control. And you can see that that waterlogged treatment is definitely sitting below when we look at the mean sap velocity of the day. Um, so that um, is, is quite nice, not, a, not anywhere near as profound as the, the uh, cherry or the, the maple that I showed you earlier, but that's quite a nice um, decline as a result of waterlogging. And then during the drain period, eventually, can you see a couple of weeks after that um, root system is reoxygenated, comes back to being exactly the same as the control group. So you can see that sort of stress cycle recovery uh, in, in, um, in action there. And this is another species, uh, Populus tremula. Um, again, we see Quite a, quite a sort of um, modest reduction in the sap velocity as a result of, of waterlogging. But very quickly, can you see how that um, this particular species uh, effectively sits in line with the control within a couple of days of being drained? So it's clearly got a very good ability to recover from you know, those short pulses of waterlogging. So my conclusions then, uh, in terms of uh, this initial phase of the study, that sap flow is a really fantastic um, as a tool to evaluate water logging tolerance. And I think, you know, will be great to, uh, you know, evaluate other stresses and other um, responses as well. It gives you great temporal resolution. Um, so, I, I mean, I had these, these uh, trees set at 10 minute temporal resolution. And uh, that's really great for evaluating stress and recovery cycles. One of the challenges with the more traditional techniques, if you like, things like just using uh, gas exchange or um, photosynthesis or smart conductors, is that you only really get a snapshot at the particular time that you're looking at the, the crown. And you know, that, that is a little bit limiting in terms of understanding the development of a stress and the recovery from the stress. Um, and it can be very time consuming if you just, if you just, if you go out with a gas exchange meter every day, for example. So it's, it's a really great tool. I think it should be more widely used. Um, tree species definitely differ really widely in the response to water logging. We can pick that up with the sap flow. Uh, and the most uh, sensitive species have, I think, a really notable response within a day, certainly within a couple of days. Um, you can really pick out that, that um, response. Um, as you might expect, photosynthesis and stomatal conductance are also sensitive to water logging um, because photosynthesis needs to necessarily integrate um, you know, the stress. And you know, great sort of message for practicing arborists, those that are out inspecting trees regularly, and that vis is visual analysis is absolutely useless for identifying this physiological stress. Um, you, you know, very rarely did I see any um, visual symptoms of the waterlogging stress. And if I did, it was well after the waterlogging event. So if you've got a tree that's um, in decline, you know, do, do consider uh, the, you know, the aeration of, of the soil and, and whether or not it's been waterlogged recently. Uh, and I think, you know, it certainly has caused me to reevaluate some of the species tolerances to waterlogging. 
I didn't show you the tilia caudata, but it's meant to be sensitive to waterlogging, but absolutely showed no response to seven days waterlogging whatsoever. Um, so I think, you know, future iterations of the species uh, guidance that, that Henrik and I put together will definitely will be, be able to include more species in that suds category, because um, I think, you know, there's, there's some things out there that ecologically are down as being sensitive, but actually um, when you put them under stress and, and look at things like sat flow, which is a good indicator of, of, of stress, um, seems like they can, they can handle it. So there's certainly more work to be done. And um, yeah, that would be, uh, yeah. And endless, endless sort of trials that we could run to, to explore the, these things further. And so uh, the next steps then, um, well, I'd like to understand, you know, a wider species palette. There's certainly plenty of other additional species uh, that we could look at. Um, I think, you know, one of the most useful things would be to evaluate things like the stress cycle. So repeated stress events, repeated stress and recovery, and then explore how different trees um, respond to those sorts of conditions. And, you know, continue to develop the analytical framework for what are quite complex time series data. Um, and it can be quite difficult to tease out um, what's the, the effect of changing in weather? What's the effect of um, the stress? Um, because, you know, as, as you saw from that op opening animation that I show, the, the VPD, the vapor pressure deficit, the atmospheric conditions, um, has this profound impact on the sap velocity. So you need to sort of understand um, those, those sap flow traces in the context of of the, uh, the atmospheric conditions as well. And so, uh, yeah, that there I think would be some really useful um, things to look at in the future. Just to, to finish then, um, just say if you're interested in tree biology and you, you haven't come across the book I co-authored with Peter Thomas, Applied Tree Biology, it might, might be for you. Um, it's it's been quite well received and, and hopefully uh, sort of is, is pretty still pretty current. So uh, yeah, please do look that up um, if you're interested in tree, tree biology and how it applies to, to practice. And uh, yeah, thank, thanks for listening. Uh, well, Dr. Hirons, that was fascinating. And I've, I've, I've got another book to add to my reading list. Thank you. <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, we have uh, several participants wondering how you actually measured the sap flow. Uh, what was the mechanism that you, you, you utilized to come to your sap flow uh, data? Well, um, if I, I, I actually, <laughs> as luck would have it, have a few slides in the, in the background here on the method that we used. Um, <laughs> So we use uh, the heat ratio method uh, to measure sap flow. And so you, you effectively have uh, three needles that you drill into the tree. And the central needle is a, is a heater. And then the two outer needles are, uh, have thermocouples in at different depths. And then uh, you, you have the, the heater probe downstream and upstream. It's a bit counterintuitive because upstream is, <coughs> is the lower needle but because the sap flow is generally going from the roots up to the crown, if that makes sense. And then you look at the, the, uh, the heat pulse as that then expands. You look at the, uh, yeah, if it's very even, that, that ratio is very even, then you, you have no, no sap flow. If it's, uh, you know, the heat is much higher in the upper probe versus the lower probe, then you, you know that the sat's flowing. And, and there's some rather complex behind the scenes sort of um, mathematics that go into this, but effectively you're measuring the sat velocity by the, the movement of heat through the stem. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. That's, that's me, a little rig with the gas exchange, if anyone's interested in that, that's a, a Cirrus 3. Um, Erga infrared gas analyzer that I had um, up on the scaffolding rig that was, I was using um, to measure the, the photosynthesis and stomatal conductance. Dr. Hirons, I'll jump in. There was a question here asked, are there different rates of stormwater retention for different species of trees? And if so, 
Is there a source for this information? Yeah, so in terms of stormwater retention of the trees themselves, um, I guess I guess most of that is related to the, the texture of the bark and the leaves, particularly. So slightly rougher leaves, a slightly rougher bark tends to hold on to the, to a greater volume of, of water. Um, obviously, the extent of the rooting zone is also very important. Um, so, uh, and the size of the tree. I mean, like all ecosystem services, you know, these things scale with the size of the tree. So if you can get a large tree with relatively rough bark, you know, a nice shag bark hickory or something like that, <laughs> um, or Quercus alba, I'm thinking of some of the North American oaks and, and so on, you know, they would be, they would be great candidates for holding a lot of water in their crowns and on their stems. Um, and if they have big root systems as well, all well and good. Yeah. In terms of is there a good, inf if, is there a good uh, source of information? Um, it's a bit disparate. Uh, but that, that guidance, I actually, one of the chapters in the beginning of, of that um, TDAG guidance that I referred to is on how you select trees to uh, enhance ecosystem services. And we talk about some of the things in there. So there's there's a chapter in there that you might find interesting. Thank you. Hey, have, oh, sorry, Bo, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to jump in. There was a follow-up question and that was kind of from somebody else wanting to know if similar research to yours has been done in North America, looking at some of the North American uh, species and their suitability to waterlogged situations. Um, I don't know exactly. Um, oh, sorry, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, <laughs> let's abort that. Um, are the, I don't. I'm not aware of anybody using sat flow in, in this way. Um, is, is the answer? So I think I think it is. It is quite uh, original. Um, I don't, yeah, I, I mean, I, but there's just massive amount of scope um, to do this work. So I, I would encourage um, people to, to do it um, if, if, if they can. I know that um, Vineland Research in, in Canada, based in Toronto, they are quite interested in, in this sort of work, um, but I don't think that they've done much. Um, and, other than that, again, I was, you know, in quite close collaboration with, with some of the folks at Morton Arboretum in Chicago. And so, um, you know, we, 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 we're looking to try and expand the, the use of sap flow to understand tree stresses. So I think over the next couple of years, there will hopefully be um, something that comes up. Thank you. Great, Dr. Hirons, we have a question here about uh, uh, consecutive flooding events. Uh, mm. Do you have any plans to build on this experiment and, and apply consecutive waterlogging or flooding events to the trees? And there's an observation that it would be helpful uh, for, to check out the suitability of species for things I don't understand here, but it's this SUDS, LID yeah. and GSI applications. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, because the whole, the whole thing with uh, SUDS in installations is that, um, you know, they, they are intentionally flooded, intentionally waterlogged, um, and repeatedly so. So the, the next logical stage would be to do that repeated stress recovery cycles. I think this, this first phase, I was kind of more interested in, um, yeah, in that having a range of different species responses. But I think the next stage would be to delve deeper and look at uh, yeah yeah those repeated stress events and see how how um, how different species respond to those repeated events, but probably just use two or three species. Um, and you know what what is really clear is that the recovery, the ability to recover from this, the, the stress, is at least as important as the as the the impact of the stress period itself. 
So one of the things I didn't show, but uh, the red maple, its most stressful period was a few days after reoxygenation. So in other words, it was that post-anoxic stress that really was you know, more problematic than the, the water logging event itself. You know, uh, and that's, a, that's the sort of thing um, which would be really interesting to explore further. Dr. Harris, there was a question here, uh, says urban soils are often compacted and have low porosity at O2 levels. Have we been indirectly selecting for water logging all along? Is that a major challenge in urban landscapes? Um, well, quite possibly, so it's a really good observation. Um, one thing I would definitely say is I think we have ignored soil aeration uh, you know, more than we ought to have done. Uh, we often think that, uh, you know, so, so it's irrigated well or whatever, that, then that's, that's going to be okay. But um, aeration is critically important for good root development. And I know that we, we do talk about having uncompacted soils and so on, um, but I think we, we massively curtail the performance of lots of our trees through poor aeration. Um, and I mean, one of the one of the useful things about some of the modern designs is you can get aeration sort of systems in into the rooting environment. But uh, we, we certainly have selected um, trees that perform well in, in those challenging environments probably are, you know, also relatively good at, at water logging tolerance. Yeah, just because they can cope with that low aeration. Um, and, and that low aeration may well just be a, a low lying stress that just leads to those things underperforming all the time. Um, and, and we probably see trees underperforming in the urban environment as a matter of course. So yeah, I do think, um, I do think to some extent we have. We, we've also, you know, things like uh, fractionus, um, which respond quite well to um, kind of stress events because they're able to regenerate roots very effectively, um, means that, um, you know, we've selected trees that are, yeah, just better at doing these things. And if we're, if we're to diversify the urban environment to make it more resilient for climate change and, and biotic threats, then one of the things that we've really got to get a handle on is, is good specification in the rooting environment so that we, we have a, a better palette of trees that is will be capable of growing. Um, so, so yeah, I think to some extent we absolutely have. Um, yeah, it's a good, good observation. Thank you. Great, uh, uh, Dr. Hirons, we had a couple of people ask if you're considering doing some research on broadleaf evergreens and, and other people wondering about conifers or evergreens in general and, and palms in your research. If only I lived somewhere I could research palms. That would be <laughs> you know, <laughs> if one of, one of you guys that lives in the California or Gulf Coast wants to sponsor me to come out and do some work on palms, I'd be very happy to. Um, yeah, I, I mean, clearly, you know, I only did nine species. They're all um, temperate, deciduous, broadleaf species. Absolutely, there's there's a there's a really important case to understand, you know, broad-leaved evergreens, which I think perhaps not in the southern part of the United North America, but, you know, in lots of temperate parts of the world, broad-leaved evergreens are massively underutilized. Um, and conifers, again, yeah, um, it would be very, very good to understand uh, their responses. I think really what this project has done is provide a framework which could be exploited you know, much more widely. Certainly if I had the, the funding, um, you know, there's, there's endless, endless questions that this is, this is sort of prompted. So, which is what, kind of what you want from research, right? But uh, it's, 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 um, it's not always possible to answer all of those things um, at, the same, at the same time in one, in one project. Um, there needs to be some, some follow-up funding. So, you know, uh, tree fund, do keep me posted if you've got any uh, slush fund, you know. <laughs> I'd be only only too happy to use it. Um, Great, thank you. 
I think we have time for another couple of questions. There was, there was a few that were related to rec recommending your, your comfort level with recommending certain species for waterlogged sites based on your research or existence of other lists. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, I think what I found both in the, the drought tolerance work that I've done and the waterlogging tolerance work that I've done is that sometimes when you um, just take evidence from the ecological literature, so in other words, the presence of a particular species, you know, and the relative proximity to a watercourse that floods regularly, for example, um, that is not always a great indication of how tolerant they, they seem to be. Um, in, in this, yeah, and I think you know there is a case for doing sort of more systematic type studies on some of these things. I mean, ultimately, in the natural environment, what we're really saying, if if something exists in the area, is that it, it's really competitive in that environment. And in the urban environment, we actually just take a lot of the vegetative com competition away, so it may perform actually really quite well when it's not pitched against all these other species that are also are just a little bit better than it. You know, and I think that's potentially what's happening with something like Tilia cordata, which according to the ecological literature is sensitive to waterlogging. But I didn't find any difference whatsoever. Um, so that just kind of turns it on its head really and suggests that the studies that have put it as sensitive um, well, I, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. It certainly challenges you to sort of reevaluate. Um, but you don't, you don't know. I mean, there may be a difference in young trees versus mature trees. There may be a difference, in, you know, in, let's say, if, if you do regular, regular flooding events, it, it may crash out at some point. And, and that's what's giving other species that it might um, grow grow within natural environments the advantage. They're better at the, that recovery stage. I mean, it just it throws up so many, so many questions. Um, but for sure, I think, you know, uh, doing some more systematic studies on things like waterlogging is, is really valuable because it can help bring in species into our, our planting palette that we wouldn't otherwise have, or we, or we, might, or we might discount just on the basis that we, we read that it doesn't really grow near rivers, for example, whereas actually it might do really quite nicely. So, yeah, I think we should be open-minded. And in, in, in relation to drought as well, often, often you know, you find um, some, some trees that are down is very drought tolerant. I mean, they just sort of basically shut up um, and close their stomata, potentially even just lose their entire crown. Um, and then they, they grow it again when the water comes back, <laughs> um, which is also not particularly a strategy. We, we want to be you know, fostering in our urban environments. We, do, we don't want those trees, even though they might be noted as being really drought tolerant. They're able to cope with water deficits, but they avoid it rather than tolerate it. And, and yeah, so yeah, understanding stress and different stress responses in trees, I think is really key to, to um, selecting trees for these challenging environments. Great. That about brings us up to the end of our hour. Dr. Hirons, this was fascinating. And I uh, really appreciate you coming on and sharing this. I had uh, a, a maximum, I think, of 800 and uh, close to 850 participants. Uh, so really extraordinarily well attended. Monica, there are many other questions. Is there a way to get these to Dr. Hirons for him to respond to some of them? Bo, is there a way to get a report of questions? Yes, and I can, uh, Dr. Hirons, I will, in a day or two, I will send you those list of questions. Um, and maybe you and Monique can discuss if you want to maybe pick out a few of those key ones, and maybe we can upload it onto the Tree Fund website as a, as a follow up to today's presentation. But I'll let uh, I'll send those to you all and y'all can discuss uh, because there are a number of questions that could be very time consuming to answer. So I wanna be sensitive to your time, Dr. Hirons, Thanks, um, yeah. with that. But uh, I wanna second, uh, Randy, thank you very much for, for taking the time to share your research with us on this webinar series. 
thanks to everybody who attended. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a pleasure to be the, the host here at Auburn University of this webinar series to have such great speakers and work with organizations like Tree Fund and their mission to fund this type of research. So as Randy said, don't forget to remember, um, I think as you see with the research today, it is well used. Um, I did see a note real quick before you jump off related to CEUs, just a reminder, we submit those CEUs on your behalf directly to ISA. You will not, you will not see the CEU code here at the end. Instead, when you registered, you provided your name and your, and your certification number. We will take that information and send it to ISA on your behalf. Uh, Monica will be working on that in the next few days. And this was recorded and will be available on the Tree Fund website. So just go to treefund.org, go to the webinars tab, and you will find it there because there was a lot of information shared today. So with that, thank you all very much. Thank you, Randy, for uh, moderating the session today, giving us the Tree Fund background. Thank you, Monica, for all the work that you do on this series. Sure. Um, it, it's, it's always a pleasure to, to work with all of you all on this. So with that, thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. And uh, goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye bye.